So we're going to carry on with a generous life this morning, and I would like you to turn with me into the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. While you're looking there, I want to just recap on a story that I told last week, the story that Jesus um, spoke about, and we're going to look at the treasure principle, how we can grow the treasure principle in our own lives. What is that going to look like? How ought it uh, to look like in our lives? So Jesus says this, he tells a story in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement and joy, he hid it again, sold everything he could, um, everything he owned, so he could get enough money together to buy the field. So this story is about the discovery of the treasure of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the life giver. Jesus Christ, the abundant life, the one who enables us to live a life that is supernaturally natural. Jesus' life, uh, Jesus Christ, the, the giver of eternal life. This is this treasure that is found. And then we see the joy, the joy of the find. And then what happens, the giving up of everything to take hold of that, which is a far better future for this man. The story starts becoming our really our reality. We're giving up everything now to take hold or to gain all that God has for us forever. We have maybe a hundred years. I don't know how long we're going to live, 70 to 100 years, something like that. But we, we've got an eternity to spend, and this is what this is about. The, the future that we have, as young as we are, as old as we are, taking hold of this treasure. Who and what we discover, Jesus and his kingdom, now becomes ours to give away. This is what this story starts leading us to. Jesus is our treasure. Jesus is our, our heart's desire. And now the treasure becomes His again. Our treasure becomes His again. It was always His. So God gets sends His Son, Jesus Christ, who take hold of us. We discover this rich and beautiful treasure, Jesus Christ. And then everything that we've been holding on to, we start letting go of. The things that are important to us, the things that we value, have been changed because now Jesus is the treasure, so it's easier for us to let go of the treasures of this world. So this is where we get this, this connection this between the spiritual life and finances. This is where we see this collaboration of faith and finances, the celebration of the life we have and the life that we've gained in Christ. So the joy of giving starts increasing in our lives because of the eternal perspective that we have. We are so earthbound. We are so dependent upon this life to feed us. We live for this place. And Jesus is saying, lift your eyes. I remember the day I got saved in 1976. This 19th of September, everything in my life started changing. Everything that was important started taking second place. The treasure, Jesus Christ, was, was glowing, glittering, wonderful for me. It was a delight of my life. And the things that were important to me now became less important to me. Jesus was the most important thing. And all of a sudden, the things I was holding on to, as I've grown in, the, in my relationship with Jesus, and I'm sure you've discovered it, the things I was holding on to, the things that would normally be the things I'd be compelled to seek after, the things I started letting go, because I'd found the treasure. It became a joyful experience for me to live out a life from an eternal perspective. So when we talk about short-term sacrifice of buying a field to gain treasure for the long-term reward, we do this because of the growing eternal perspective that we have. And then what we start discovering, the joy of the gain becomes the joy of our giving. You get that? However, <laughs> we are so easily distracted and we're so easily diverted and derailed. And it's life and it's the devil and it's our choices that lead us astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. So it's not just one thing, it's everything, and that's our reality. So we can have a full-on blame. We can blame life, we can blame the devil, and we can blame ourselves. And we need to stop doing that. We need to see what does God have for us through Jesus Christ. So Jesus speaks to us in Matthew chapter 6. So go with me there from verse 19. 
Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven. I love Eugene Peterson's interpretation of this. He says, stockpile treasures in heaven. Stockpile treasures. It's not like throw one or two Kruger coins and coins into the eternal treasury. He's saying, stockpile, do what you can, everything you can, pile it up. Let me just put a little gap here. The eternal perspective that we have is very simple. The increasing awareness that this life is limited and eternal life is unlimited. And our role is to make sure we get everyone possible into heaven. Uh, we have to trash the fallacy of that this life is the important life. The important, the reason why we exist is to get people into heaven. It's not about a better life here. It's about what we can do to get as many people possible into heaven where they can spend eternity with God. That's our role. Stockpile treasures in heaven. Where moths and rust cannot destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Verse 22, he says, Jesus says this, Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body, and where your eye is, when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No man can serve two masters or gods. You will hate one and be devoted to the other. You will love one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Jesus is pointing his finger in us. If you, if you want to discover the, the principle of the kingdom, this, this treasure principle, he's saying, you need to hear what I'm saying to you here. And he goes on and his tone changes a bit. I think his tone would change in the next part of this conversation. He says, so, so, so that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink. Or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They, they don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't they more valuable? Aren't you more valuable to Him than, than they are? Can, can your worries add a single moment to your life? Now Jesus is, is going into the very, you know, the... the the, the, the sensitive part of our lives, how we are so self-consumed by this world and how our minds, our lives, our time, our energy, our treasures are consumed into looking after ourselves. Why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they, how they grow. They can't make, they don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as one of they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and, and thrown in the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. And then He goes, why do you have such a little faith? We're talking about my heavenly Father. We're talking about the God of creation. Why do you have so little faith? You can trust Him. So don't worry about these things. What you eat and what you drink and what you wear, these things dominate the thoughts of pagans, unbelievers, and then he goes, but your heavenly Father already knows all you need. Isn't that amazing? Jesus redirecting our attention. Don't you remember the treasure you discovered? Don't you know who he is? Don't you remember giving up everything to take hold of him? Why are you letting the stuff of this world loosen your grip on the treasure you found in Christ? Then he goes, seek first the kingdom of God above everything else. Seek the kingdom of God first. Seek His righteousness, live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So what Jesus is challenging us with is with this world, this life, the, the physical stuff that we live with. And it's not unimportant. What's important is what we do with it. And how we learn to live in relationship with God in this world. So Jesus says something about money and possessions here. So what I want to do, if I can, I want to, I want to direct your attention to six pointers 
that help us establish the treasure principle in our lives. I'm under no um, illusion that the Christian life is an instant life. That the, the moment you start, it all happens. I, I understand from Scripture and from my own experience and from the experiences of many that the Christian life is a journey. It's day by day. Uh, it's one step of faith after the other. As Eugene Peterson says, it's long obedience in the same direction. It's a shuffle through life, and we're making choices and decisions every day. Every day there is in us an increasing measure of grace. Every day we discover more and more about the life that God has led us into. We call this the, the, road, the road of righteousness or the highway of holiness or the, or the street of sanctification. It's this journey that God has with us where we walk with Him, the human and the divine, discovering all that He has for us. And the treasure becomes more and more real. We hold on to the treasure Jesus Christ with all our might and we let go of the treasures of this world so that we can live freely in Him. These six pointers I want to uh, point to your uh, attention this morning. Address this issue of this journey. I know that the treasure principle is something that grows in us. That's the promise of Jesus. It's a kingdom seed that keeps growing. This is not an instant thing. This is a growing thing. So just imagine this morning as the kingdom is growing in you, as the principles of the kingdom are applied in your lives, in our lives, so this principle becomes more and more evident within us and through us. So point in number one, when we look at what Jesus is saying, he says this, point in number one, stockpile treasures in heaven. In other words, we, we need to get an increasing eternal perspective for our lives. More and more. Letting go. And the only way we, we grow this uh, eternal perspective is that we start learning to let go. The joy that we have in Christ becomes the joy we have in letting go of the stuff that has held us. You know, in the world that we live in, our world, our everyday, there is a demand on all of us to invest our everything here and now. Throw it all in. Lock, stock, and barrel. This is where you must invest. And Jesus says the counterculture thing. He says the very opposite. He's saying stockpile treasures in heaven. Get an eternal perspective for your life. Make heaven your priority. Aim for the eternal crown. Pay it forward. The eternal life is a gift that is given to us free by God in His Son, Jesus Christ. We do not deserve it. We cannot earn it. It is a given. If you believe and you accept Him as Lord and Savior, He gives you the gift of eternal life. It is done. But what Jesus is saying here in this treasure principle pointer is this. How we live here determines our eternal life reward how we live here how we live here is not going to get us into heaven jesus gets us into heaven how we live here determines our eternal reward and you know we know this we cannot take our money and our possessions with us when we die it doesn't matter how tightly you stuff them in your pocket when you in your they stuff it in your pocket or shroud you in gold or whatever they do. When you die, it all stays behind. Gravity still sucks. But what you can do is you can we can use our money and our possessions for God's glory and the advancement of his kingdom while we're here. We can pay it forward. You see, our reward in heaven is not a gold chest of treasure. We, we don't have a pagan belief system. We trust in God. Our, our belief system is that when we get there, he will reward us. But he rewards us not with physical things. He rewards us when we get into his presence we see all the people that our investment here has enabled people to get into heaven. We see all those people. 
We're not going to get 40 virgins and a bottle of whiskey and a, you know, a, a favorite golf club or a 14-bedroom um, house. I mean, what a lot of hoo-ha. How does that work? That is pagan thinking. When we get our reward is a result of our work on earth. Man, we should be working. God has created us so that we can make sure that as many people on earth get to heaven. That's why we do urban ignition. That's why we want kids to find Christ. That's why we have a church. That's why you have jobs. That's why some of you are professionals. That's why some of you go to clubs and, and join gym. I don't know why we join gym. But the res end result is that through these lives we have that God has entrusted us with, we stockpile treasure in heaven. Because our perspective is an eternal one. In contrast, is the big short. In contrast to stockpiling heaven, stockpiling our treasure in heaven is the big short. Getting to heaven and everything that we've done on earth, we've done for ourselves. And then when we look, there's no one in heaven because of us. That's the big short. We're in heaven. There's no reward. My reward is when a friend of mine who was a drug addict and we've sown into that person's life and we get to heaven and they're in heaven. That's my big reward. I couldn't care about a gold bar. I've had the gold bar here. Well, I sort of wish. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a different life. What a waste of life not to invest for heaven's sake. What a privilege. What a powerful gift God has given us to be able to stockpile treasure in heaven. Everything we are, everything we have can just fill heaven with people who can worship our glorious King. Point to number two, Jesus says, check your heart. Check your heart. I think that's the first, the very first thing we need, we need to do. Wherever your treasure is, Jesus says, there you'll find the desires of your heart. Our hearts follow our treasure. So, so where is your treasure? What has your heart? For, for where your heart is, what will you find there? Who will you find there? If, if we follow the trail of our treasure, we'll find our hearts. And you know, we, we, uh, we'll, we always want to follow our treasure, if we're honest. But one thing we do discover, the Bible tells us, if we're honest enough with ourselves, our hearts are wicked above all things and will deceive us. Check our hearts. Is our treasure Jesus Christ? If we follow the trail, we'll find Jesus at the center of our lives. Check our hearts. No one else can do that for me. No one else can do that for you. Only you and God can check our hearts. But if our hearts are conquered by the love of God, we want more of Him and all that He's promised for us. That's what we want. Stockpile treasures in heaven. Check our hearts. Third pointer, be self-honest. This has to be the hardest thing. It's that little verse in between, you know, what Jesus says about the Father and the treasure of our hearts. Be self-honest. He talks about the eye. If your eye is healthy, then your whole body is full of light. But if your eye that you think is light but is actually dark, how dark the darkness. Healthy sight, healthy sight is not the ability to be able to read and look far. Healthy sight is the ability to look at our own hearts. That's healthy sight. To know when you run out of steam or to know when you're running on your own steam. That's healthy, healthy sight. No one else can check your heart but you. 
I'm the only one who can be honest with myself. And the true story is, you have no idea who I am. Only I know I, who I really am, and God. And Jesus said, well, you, you can judge them by their fruit. That's cool, but I can make my life look fruity. If you know what I mean. So here's a real radical challenge to us all. Don't, don't ignore the important things in our lives. The things that God deals with. I was with a bunch of friends this weekend, and we all grew up in the same church when I first got saved. And um, most of us got saved in that sort of period of time, and out of the six guys, four of them are in ministry. Four of us were in ministry. And uh, we are talking about things, and, and, and I managed to just squeeze in a little conversation about this. I, I said, the, the reality for you, all of you, is you have no idea what's going in my heart. You, you can see me, but you wouldn't know, actually, if I'm watching pornography. I do. You don't. And I, so I thought, let me poke the bear even more. I said, um, I, didn't even, I, I wouldn't even know if you're doing that. The conversation did get quieter at that point. I said, if, if you tell, I'll tell. You see, no one knows. Only you can be honest with yourself. I learned that secret when I got saved. You guys are young guys. Learn that secret now. Learn the secret of, of learning to be self-honest. Go to God. Go to God first. Go to the Spirit of God. Say, oh, Spirit of God, fill me so that I can live for my King. Stockpile tre treasures in heaven. Check out our hearts first and be self-honest. We can look bright on the outside, but inside can be very dark and gloomy. And Jesus is wanting us. If you're wanting to discover the fullness of this treasure principle, if you want to take hold of this treasure principle and see it working in its fullness in your life, be honest. Be honest with yourself. One of the greatest spiritual leaders of our time, a fantastic human being, a great Jesus follower, wrote a book about this. And no one knew what was going on in his life. And the very thing he wrote about was the very thing he fell to. No one knew. A bestseller. No one knew. Because only we know our hearts. And we have to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves and God. The fourth pointer is we're not designed to sit on a fence. There's no fence sitting if you're a Jesus follower, if we are going to live out the treasure principle, there's no in-between. There's no sitting on the fence. Jesus said, you, you, you'll love one God or you'll hate the other. You'll be enslaved to one or you'll be free. You must choose. Choose one, trust one, follow one, serve one. We're designed for that. Money is a test. Money is a test. But money is also trust. God is trust. So test Him. Our choice of trust should be tested. The God we choose to trust in, we should test. And God openly says, test me. See, see who I am. And then choose. If I don't come up true to who I am, then choose the other God. But also ask the other God. Test Him. You see, there are two kingdoms. And there are two masters. But we are only created to serve one. We can't serve two masters. We can't sit on the fence. The life of God worship is about hearts of uncompromising devotion. The life of God worship is a life of unashamed love, wholehearted love for God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our might. The, the difference between the God options 
And the choice we have to make is choosing between having an owner which makes us a slave or having a father who makes us a child. And a slave, you're not free. And you have no inheritance. But a, a child, a son and a daughter, you're free. And you have an inheritance. And it's a choice that we must have. A slave who is an owner has a fear-driven relationship with us. But a son and a daughter who have a father have love-motivated relationships. We must choose, Jesus is saying. Choose who you must serve. So there are five pointers so far. Stockpile treasures in heaven. Check our hearts. Be self-honest. And don't be a fence-sitter. That's what Jesus is saying. Because if we work out these things, we start discovering this wonderful principle of the treasure principle working in our lives and working through our lives every day. The, that was the fourth. The fifth pointer is trust one. Trust the, the one you trust, worship. The one we trust, worship. But the one we trust, we can worship because he is a, a loving and caring and providing father. He sees us. He knows us. How do I know that? Because Jesus says, your father in heaven knows all you need. He sees us. And Jesus followers know Jesus. Jesus followers know Jesus because they know his word. Jesus followers have faith in him and in his word. Jesus followers obey his words. And you know that it's your obedience in his word. Listen to this. It's your obedience in his word that has tested his word. You have proven that God is good in your obedience to Him. As we have risked by faith to trust in God and our lives become acts of obedience on a daily, minute by minute, daily basis, we start to see as we test His Word that God is good all the time. That He keeps His promises to us. That He is a provider. That He is a protector. That He is powerful. We can't, we can't be in between. Jesus tells us that a, a life of worship is about the choices we make and our ability to trust our Father with everything we need. And it's our need to constantly seek Him. We have that growing need within us to seek Him. We don't worship God, <laughs> but we do. But we don't worship God so that He can provide for us. Just trying to earn something from God. We worship God because He is God. Worship the one we trust. If we trust Him, we know He'll provide. Let's worship. The sixth one Pointer, first is first and best is best. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right from the very beginning, when man had relationship with God, there's always been a call for first and best. Give me your first and give me your best. And I believe our first and our best flows out of our new and growing reality. And our new and growing reality is our new and growing identity in God. And our identity in God, I think, can be seen in three ways. So the first and the best flows out of who I know I am. Does that make sense to you? When I know who I am, it's because I know who He is. I'm a son and daughter of God. So the first aspect of, of knowing how this flows in my identity with God is to hear these words, in Christ I am a new creation. That's my identity. I am brand new. I am becoming new every day. My identity is old is gone, new has come. I am new. I am not what I was. That's my identity. In other words, the first and the best flows 
from my newness. You see, if my first and my best had to flow out of the tussle between the old and the new, old would win. But actually, the first and the best flows from who I am. I am new in Christ. The second thing about our identity that's important is, is to all who believe and accept Him, He gives the right to become children of God, which is saying to all of us here, if you receive and accept Jesus Christ, we're children of God. We're sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. We're discovering, aren't we, on this journey, what it is to be God's kids as much as we're discovering what it is to have a father like that, unlike the father that we have here. He's a good father. And we know from Scripture that He says He can meet every need. So we pray this prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done. As it is in heaven. Is that right? Let Your kingdom come, let Your will be done. Then we say this. Give us today our daily bread. Only sons and daughters can pray that prayer. You know why? Because they know who their dad is. That their dad will never let them down. They say, oh, please give me my bread. And the bread comes into our hands. Why? Because he's a good God. It's not like a snake or a stone. He gives us what we ask for. He is a good dad. You see, the best and the first flows from knowing that we're sons and daughters. Our devotion is not to get His provision. Our devotion is because He's our Father. We never have to second-guess God. We, we never have to sit in, on the fence. We never have to play in both teams. We just simply trust our Heavenly Father. Why? Because He's our Heavenly Father. And His words to us are true. No one else makes the promises God does. Nowhere ever in the history of man's existence has anyone made the promises that God has. Has anyone even kept close to fulfilling the promises they made? God has fulfilled every promise. Constantly fulfilling every promise in our lives. Following Jesus is living as a child of God. The first and the best flows from our sonship and our daughtership. Because here's the deal. Sons and daughters inherit. That's where it flows from. It flows that we know we have an inheritance in God. And thirdly, for, this, for God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And in truth means in the revelation we have of Jesus Christ. Jesus' followers are worshipers and He expects constant, listen to this, wholehearted devotion to him he expects that from his very own children he expects complete love he knows he's not going to get it but that's what he expects of us and he knows we're on a journey so more and more as we hold on to him our treasure we let go of the stuff that we have been holding on to and we start giving back to god what is actually his our devotion our devotion to God could be spelt like this. Our love for God could be spelt like this. F-I-R-S-T. Or B-E-S-T. That's how love and devotion in a Jesus follower, if we know who we are, that's how it should be spelt. This is how we, we could spell love. F-I-R-S-T. Or B-E-S-T. That's how we can spell our love and devotion to God. So our, our first and our best is evident in what we do with our time. Our first and our best is seen in what we do with all our talents and our energy. Our first and our best becomes a reality when we start investing here on earth to get people into heaven. So our best and our first flows from a place of worship, from sonship, from being new in Christ. Six pointers. Shall I re recap them quickly? One, stockpile treasures in heaven. Two, check your hearts first. Three, be self-honest. Four, 
Don't be a fence sitter. Five, the one we trust, worship. And six, first is first, best is best. The treasure principle is a principle that'll grow every day, like it has been promised in our lives. And we've got to trust that God is true to His Word and evident in every area of our lives. I believe when we are, have fully taken hold of Jesus, we start letting go more and more of the stuff of this world. The joy of Jesus then becomes the joy of our giving. Our time, our talents, our treasure, it's not an issue. Behind it, a reward, a, a heavenly place filled with hundreds and thousands of people. They're there because of how we've lived, how we've invested in this world. Amen? What a principle, hey? It's exciting, hey? To think that everything we do counts for heaven.